Hello, my name is David de Blenheis. Uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Washington's Department of Communication. Uh, I'm really happy to be here at Collective Intelligence 2020 to talk about my research on the population ecology of online collective action. I've been working on this project with Aaron Shaw and my advisor, Benjamin Mako Hill. Sort of the basic observation which motivates this project is that when you go to online uh, platforms for mobilizing collective action like change.org, you often find very similar uh, attempts at mobilizing participation in things that are online petitions, right? So here we see four different online petitions um, on change.org that are all about uh, dog meat consumption. They're all trying to shut down uh, the dog, uh, the Yulin Dog Meat Festival or similar things. And many of them are actually about that very festival. Um, and they're all created around the same time. They use similar language, they have similar titles, similar imagery. Uh, and they have varying levels of participation. Uh, and I think this is something of a puzzle because you might think that uh, all of these petitions could compete with one another over potential signatories. Right? Um, people have a limited amount of time and attention that they're willing to pay to things like this. But on the other hand, these petitions might be, you know, they're part of the same movement. So maybe uh, the movement is, you know, building online and that's why they're creating some petitions, right? So maybe that petitioning is becoming legitimated among that movement, or maybe that movement is you know, becoming more legitimate in the eyes of people who sign on the petitions. So to think about this sort of interdependence between similar online petitions, I'm drawing this concept of discursive fields from uh, the sociology of social movements. And discursive fields uh, intend to describe the sort of cultural constraints, contextual constraints on what can be said and what it means. There's a long-running discussion about this idea uh, and how it relates to the sort of broader process of framing and how social movements um, end up using the words or slogans or uh, ideas that they do. Um, um, the, so I think this concept of discursive fields, it's useful for thinking about um, how these sort of like cultural, these sort of concept, sorry, these contextual constraints uh, play out in, you know, these historical narratives about these movements. But it's harder to see how they relate to something like uh, online petitions, which happen on a lot. There's like so many of them, um, and it seems like, you know, and, the, and I want to understand something that's going on in a more general way, right? So, is there are there sort of more general forces that work within discursive fields that can constrain participation in social movements? And I'm turning to ecological social, ecological models in another part of sociology and organizational sociology for this. Um, so these models are very good at describing and making predictions about how interdependence between organizations would shape the growth of industries or uh, success of organizations. Some, and it gives us some questions that we can ask about online petitions in discursive fields. We can ask about whether online petitions with similar frames will benefit from legitimacy with one another. We can ask if they'll compete with, over, will compete with one another over resources or over pot potential signers. Um, and we can also ask if specialization could be a viable solution to competition, right? Maybe um, so in, in specialization, you have you know, large generalists um, that maybe control most of the resources, but they are not that efficient in some parts of the, um, the world. And so um, specialists can occupy those positions and then uh, do better and, and at least survive and thrive maybe in those smaller niches. So we'll talk about that. Um, so but first we're going to talk about density. Um, and the idea of density is just the sort of population size relative to the niche size. So this might be the number of petitions in a topic. Uh, and the idea of density dependence is you have sort of this, um, this, this, this sort of countervailing forces of legitimacy and competition. Right? As density increases, so does legitimation. But competition is a second order of density. So you kind of don't want, it's like you don't want to be uh, weird, but you don't want to be redundant. Or, or uh, you want to be special, but not weird. Um, as you, so if, if you're making a petition that's not similar to any other petitions, that might reflect that your petition uh, doesn't have a lot of um, people who would be interested in signing it, or maybe that it's not even complying with like the norms of the genre of a petition. But if your petition is very, very similar to many other petitions, then why would they sign your petition and not one of the others? This trade-off between legitimacy and competition often produces a curvilinear effect of density on success, or a curvilinear association between density and success, if you're, depending on whether you have causation or correlation. Um, so for example, we can talk about uh, newspapers. Uh, in the, uh, <clears throat> this is from uh, Carroll's study of 
newspapers and density dependence. Uh, and you find that early newspapers struggle for legitimacy. Uh, this is an example of the first newspaper. It's called Public Occurrences, both foreign and domestic. It was published in Boston in the 1700s, uh, sorry, the 1600s, um, in the 17th century. And it was shut down quickly by the government for publishing the facts as they saw it, um, which, or the news as they saw it, um, by undermining the state's authority to construct facts. The newspaper um, you know, was illegitimate and it was an illegitimate source of facts and was shut down by the government. Um, but in the 1830s, democratic liberalization, the freedom of the press, and, uh, and the economies of, of the printing press uh, made it much more viable to run newspapers. And he, so this shows the number, of, uh, the number of newspapers in a given city over time. Uh, and you see this common pattern where you find, oh, there's a, uh, initially not very many newspapers, but then uh, once you have a handful of successful ones, the number of newspapers grows exponentially, um, but then it hits a limit, and then as competition zips in, and then it declines. So you see this trade-off between legitimacy and competition unfolding over time. So if competition is a salient and important dynamic, uh, specialization might also be, because specialization is often a solution to competition. Um, specialists, by drawing from fewer resource pools, can escape competition from generalists. Um, and when they can do that, you find conditions of concentration. As large generalists coexist with smaller specialists, the inequality of the resource distribution is higher. Um, so yeah, so that's the idea of socialization. For example, we can think about the microbrewery movement in the United States. Um, so today, we have you know, many, many, many breweries. Uh, and most of them are small, and they, there's also a huge variety in the kind of beer that's available. But not so long ago, 25, 30 years ago, we didn't have that. Instead, we had a smaller number of very large breweries. But even that wasn't always the case. We can go back to the early 20th century and post-prohibition period, when there was actually a quite large number of breweries, um, but then uh, over time there was conglomeration. And this was probably due to regulation because the regulations limited the variety of beers that could be made and also how they could be marketed. And this um, meant that economies of scale became the most salient factor in the industry. Um, so larger breweries could be more efficient and smaller breweries, and there were no opportunities to specialize. Um, and so you have this conglomeration, whereas you get the, big, the breweries get bigger and bigger, and they become fewer and fewer of them. Um, but then deregulation happened in the 80s, uh, but there was some time before microbreweries started becoming viable and popular. And this is a sort of period of legitimation. But once a handful of uh, microbreweries were successful, then the number of microbreweries takes off. Um, and because the big breweries didn't change into microbrewers, and they couldn't even really compete with them very well, the microbreweries survived, and the big breweries also survived. So we have a coexistence of generalists and specialists, uh, and that leads to, um, to concentration. Now, it's important to note that the reason the, another reason the microbreweries could survive was because of the strong preference for locality that emerged in American culture in the in the 90s, um, and that's that's another important factor. Uh, and those can be thought of as like the, the conditions that create the sort of that's an important part of the conditions that create opportunities for specialists. Right, that there, you have these um, these smaller niches that the specialists can occupy and occupy the generalists in. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about what I did, um, and that's. I did some topic modeling of online petitions from change.org. Um, and the idea is that by co-clustering documents and topics, we can uh, measure density based on how many petitions are similar to yours. We have a measure of, of similarity um, in, in terms of the document's topic memberships. Um, but we also have a measure of specialization in terms of the inequality of those topic, membership, <coughs> those topic memberships. Um, so, uh, I'm, so the goal of my analysis is essentially to operationalize these concepts of overlap density, concentration, and frame specialization, and then test those propositions about density dependence and resource partitioning. Um, and I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how I do, do that. It's you know it's some basic information theory. Um, but we can talk about that later if you want. Well, at least I hope I don't really know how this conference is going. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay. So. Uh, so I'm going to talk about my results. 
Um, so as I talked about with density dependence, um, there's a trade-off between uh, competition and, and legitimacy, right? So if we found, and what I found was mostly competition. So if there, we found this trade-off, then we would have found a second order effect of overlap density, and that effect would have been positive. Um, and instead we found a negative effect only in the first order. Um, so that looks like this, as overlap density goes up, uh, the signature count goes down. So uh, I pretty much just find straight up competition between petitions here in, in terms of this framework. <clears throat> when we talk about research partitioning, um, this would have been predicted when, or sorry, this would have been indicated if <coughs> um, specialists do better under conditions of concentration. And uh, I end up finding that you know the specialists are smaller, um, they have fewer participants than the generalists in general, but um, but they don't seem to have advantages in concentration. There doesn't seem to be a relationship between uh, how well specialists will do um, and how concentrated their their local environment is. So in discussion, I think the number one takeaway from this project is that we can use ecological concepts to think about. Um, these contextual constraints on when collective action frames can mobilize, and they can tell us something about uh, how these online petitioning platforms might be working. And I think this is valuable because and important because, um, you know, before this, I think most of the thought about ecological dynamics has been applied to situations where resources are more tangible, right? And they think about you might think about legitimacy, but you might think about le legitimacy as instrumental to getting a loan or getting access to a market. Um, but here we're thinking about uh, legitimacy and ecological dynamics as being more directly related to like the similarity of the text and, and, and by making those dynamics measurable through text it might open up more kinds of analyses that we in more ways we can use these ecological concepts. So in, in this study of change.org you know you might have thought that there would be like sort of a rosier picture of like digital mobilization <clears throat> where um, similar campaigns were legitimating one another, right? So maybe the answer, the answer to like why there's so many online petitions that are similar was because well the movements are doing are actually sort of exploring the space and they're legitimizing petitioning to one another and they're making their petitions more successful. That would have been a a, a rosier sign, um, but instead we seem to find that competition is more salient. That the more petitions are similar, the less they do on average. Um, and and this I think this might be a little bit discouraging if. Uh, you were somebody who was very, you know, had a very positive idea of what change.org could be about. Um, and, and to make matters worse, we don't find that specialization can really help petitions avoid competition. Okay. Uh, sort of final points. I think that the topic models are all kind of a coarse measure here. Um, I think potentially more advanced language models could do better or find different things. Um, and uh, I also think that a more sort of qualitative content analysis could could perhaps reveal be, or be used to study ecological dynamics and, and maybe in a more um, you know maybe a little more grounded and nuanced way than you could do with automatic text analysis. Uh, I think that my results might be pretty particular to change order because I think that they make sense when you think about um, particular design aspects of change.org, right? Change.org doesn't really have many affordances for collaboration between people who are making different petitions. It doesn't really seem to have a lot of mechanisms by which people would be able to sign all of the petitions within a social movement. Instead, it tries to sort of gatekeep those kind of collaborative channels uh, and, and you can get them but only if you pay and that's kind of the business model, right? You can get um, access to the, you can like have emails sent to people who signed related petitions, um, but mainly if you pay, change.org can do that for you. All right, uh, that's what I have. Uh, thank you. Uh, have a good day. Uh, hopefully we'll get some discussion. I don't know. Bye.